Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. All right, folks, I'm live here with the man himself, Justin Harris. We are going. <laughs> What's up, Justin? Zoom's or my focus. It's <laughs> still not working. Yeah, I think it's picking up the microphone, but uh, I don't know what you do about that. It's, it's well, I got a big microphone, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you and me both, man. Now mine's not working. There it goes. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to get Justin on today. We'll do a live Q&A on uh, nutrition. I figured it would be good for some people here. Um, we, any nutrition, bodybuilding questions that you guys have, uh, feel free to ask them. And I might even bring some people on live if you're feeling brave. So we, we can do that. So what's been going on, Justin? It's it's contest prep season. I'm sure you got somebody competing every weekend. Yeah, I just had a, a girl, Christina Sutton, win uh, overall in both figure and physique. Uh, yesterday, she's uh, now get ready for Masters Nationals, so she's uh, got a couple more weeks for that. I've had a, a number of, I had a guy, uh, a bunch of people, BJ Henry did well, uh, Abby uh, Pfeiffer did well last week. Uh, I had a client, two shows now, absolutely inside out shredded. I mean, striated glutes all the way up to, to, to the lower back, just just shredded not place well two shows in a row in classic and it's driving me crazy because it's not you know look, it's not like the shape is terrible and you see the other placings and they're you know they're really out of shape compared to i mean he was like incredible conditioning and so uh i still need to see the uh video i guess just to i mean maybe his posing wasn't right or something you get more in the center of the screen but uh the judging has been weird this year. I don't know. I, I think um, I don't know if, if people are just scared because of the, the all the Washington Post stuff. But I, I heard, like, I heard from some people that they were not not um, having wanting people pushing conditioning as much. I don't know if that's a bunch of BS or what. I, I believe it, but that sucks. We didn't, but we didn't even use a diuretic with to do. I mean, if you're shredded, you're shredded. You know, like yeah. the risk isn't being super lean. The risk is taking a bunch of you know diuretics if you're you know i mean i always say go back to the old battle for the olympias with uh when mr okabe used to film them you know you'd see ronnie coleman or ronnie coleman in the un unbelievable five and a half weeks out of the olympia and he's got strided glutes and he's shredded and and he's still got five weeks of dieting when you're when you're in shape you know and he was you know obviously you know what kind of weights he was lifting there so when you're, when you're in shape it's not unhealthy to be low fat it's the unhealthy is if you're taking mass amounts of stimulants, if you're using diuretics. And so it just, you know, it's, it, I guess there's not other than testing, there's, there's no way to punish it other than to punish people for being in shape. I don't know, but it's hard as a coach to know, you know, for 23 years, your goal is to get people shredded. Yeah. I have a woman that's a pro bodybuilder and she said they told them that they didn't want shredded glutes. And then, so she didn't come in with the show with the shredded glutes that we, we 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 kept kept didn't push it that far and then they penalized her for not having shredded glutes. I'm like, so yeah, I don't know what. It's always you, you, it it's so hard. The women's divisions are so hard, so hard because you have uh, wellness wellness like state level wellness is not even the same sport as pro wellness. You know the pro wellness girls are friggin' jacked. They're huge. You know they're yeah. they're like bodybuilder size, just a little softer. And most of the, the, you go to a local level, like a novice wellness, and it's basically bikini crossovers, some figure crossovers. And so it's, it's hard to, you know, if a girl comes in ready to win the nationals as a wellness competitor and you put her in wellness at some local novice show, she's probably going to get marked down for being, a, for being huge when she's ready to go win nationals. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, is subjective. Okay. Tina, Tina was talking about. Yeah, it's, it's getting it's, more so for the men. It used the men at least used to be easy. It's like okay, if you're if you're a male bodybuilder, that simple. Be as huge, as big, as hard, and shredded and dry as possible. Just just go all the way. 
And then even like a classic physique was basically the same. Just be, you know, but not worry so much about fullness. And then there's a lot more genetic component of your natural shape, but just get shredded. Now there's, uh, that's not, that doesn't seem to be a, oh, I just realized my name is spelled wrong. I changed that. <laughs> that's okay. What was the client you had that was super shredded? I want to see if I can find him on Instagram. Uh, Chris Cashman. Chris Cashman. Yeah. Uh, Chris Cashman. Let's see, let's see if this is him. Uh, let's see. Let me bring him up here. People are asking if I can show him. Let's see here. Is this the guy? Yeah, see if you can get one from the back. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, damn maybe show my glute. Maybe what? Well, maybe yeah. Maybe he didn't pose that well because if I was him, that's what I'd be. Yeah, I mean, he's and this that was. What, what I mean, was that's shredded, that? man. Yeah, that was after. So that was even he. He's even a little softer because that's after eating and picking out and everything. Man, he's got a I mean, tiny he, waist. Yeah, he's flat. We could have been fuller. His metabolism kind of went on overdrive on us. The whole last couple of weeks were, uh, I mean, we just kept adding food. It was, you know, he'd, he'd check in coach. I, I got two pounds two days in a row. You know, I said, okay, well, let's add 100 grams of carbs after every workout. Coach, I'm still dropping two pounds. Okay, let's add 100 grams of carbs before every workout. And let's do an unlimited high day. And, you know, I mean, you've been there when your metabolism just kind yeah. of went away. So we could we could have had him fuller for sure. But, uh, yeah, he is. He's, yeah, as you can see, down a little bit lower uh, than that most muscular. It's a little fuller there. Yeah, he's definitely fuller there. Yeah, but for that, I mean, wow, that, that's a crazy difference. Yeah, but th for that to not win, uh, yeah, that's uh, like almost exactly a year. And for that, I don't to not even be like top three. I don't think he was at a local show. And then, and the, I mean, no, no offense to the other competitors, but. It, it wasn't the Atlantic States, you know, or the, or the California. And you said he was classic. Yeah, yeah. It seems like they're classic guys. Like they don't want them as shredded. At least I, that's what I've seen. I don't know. I, yeah, and Chris Bumstead's pretty goddamn peeled on stage. Yeah, I mean he is, but he's also full too. So well, I, yeah, I, but he holds himself back. I mean, he he could be an open competitor. He uh, he really. Uh, but he's he's one of the few guys probably actually doing bodybuilding healthy because he's he's got to keep his weight down so he's not really pushing anything you know because he's he's, he's he, i mean he could probably he could add i bet 30 pounds of muscle he could do a Derek lunsford easily yeah I, I heard him talking about how he only runs 500 milligrams of tests in the offseason everybody was calling him a liar and i'm like it's probably true because he it, struggles not, to make weight yeah it's that's what people i mean yeah, it's 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 hard because like the, obviously that stuff's part of the sport and everyone's doing it, but people forget that you know like you play a sport. There's offensive linemen, there's defensive linemen, there's linebackers, there's cornerbacks, there's court. Yep. So there are natural builds, you know. Like some people just are not. It's you know for at him at his height, it's probably not hard for him to be two twenty in de in decent shape when he's eating perfect and and taking stuff. You know, just not. It's like people think if you have a a drop of muscle. <laughs> His name's probably Felter Snatch. <laughs> I thought it was Justin Sider. Yeah, Justin Sider. I got, speaking of Justin Sider, we have uh, Dr. Justin Sider, DPT's uh, clothing's for sale on my site with uh, him and Dr. Cole Hands, OBGYN, <laughs> if you want. <laughs> oh, man. I just put some limited edition goofball clothing up at Japona Nutrition. I don't know if you saw yesterday, but I, I we had Roman Fritz on our podcast. It, that was it was insane talking to Roman. I, I could he was talking about him dieting for shows, eating six hundred grams yeah. of carbs a day. Yeah, he's apparently his metabolism is just just not human. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I heard like thousand gram carbs every day off season, and he's always he shredded. He's a, he said he doesn't do any cardio. And he and he's eating six hundred. He said he cuts his carbs in half for contest prep. He yeah. he was doing twelve hundred in the off season, so it's two hundred a meal. And it's a the, the the range. You know, they say there's not that big of a range metabolically. Um, like 
it's you know like it's kind of a, a normal distribution and a gaussian distribution you know where you have like one standard deviation it starts getting pretty rare most people have about the same metabolism but i've seen some wild metabolisms one in the opposite direction i have we have up on team troponin uh, uh pro card winning prep someone who won won his pro card in 2000 was it 15 16 and that that was it was 2016 and that was him winning his pro card and uh, and this is a guy that was 278 the night before the Arnold in 2017, and not tall. Uh, and if you look at what he got, he got to eat, you it would blow your mind. It was someone who was known for having difficulty getting in shape and and having issues with diuretics and things with uh, with other. You want, to, you want to see something wild? This is him right yeah. now, 270. Six weeks out from his show, no cardio, 600 grams of carbs a day. Yeah. Oh, man. How fun would bodybuilding be? If you have an appetite. See, I have a massive – I am I got screwed. I have a massive appetite and a terrible metabolism. His legs have really come up. Incredible progress on his legs. He's had a hip replacement. He just had a hip replacement. That's insane. Yeah, that, that, was, that was what was nuts. And then he was – uh. He he was uh he was telling us he almost died after he had his hip replacement. He had uh had an infection. They had to go back through and redo it. He was in a coma. It was Jesus. Yeah, yeah. He, said he was uh, in the hospital. That stuff scares me because I'm I'm supposed to get. I, I need uh, at least one, probably two. I mean, need is you know is more. Yeah, you're going to need one. It's never going to get better. I've been told for s- several years now that I'll know when it's time. Uh, and it hasn't quite been there yet, but I'm he not, said he, I'm said not he feels better than he ever has with the new hip. He said he wants oh, yeah. to get his other one done. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, they, that's what the other thing they say is just is uh like it, the technology improves so fast. And I talked to a doctor first. The first time I had problems, I got like an MRI. It was way back in like 2008 or 2009. And he said he's like you'll need one. He said, but wait, the technology is just improving so fast. He says like every year you wait, you know twice a day yeah he, yeah. yeah he was telling us he works out twice a day he does push pull legs two times a day six days a week and the uh n- no no cardio yeah and, i mean that's uh, a lot that's a high workload it, well yeah i mean he's probably i mean his metabolic demand has got to be crazy with working out that much yeah i mean if he's doing a hard workout at his size you're t- that's a thousand calories probably do two thousand calories he's got a you know basal metabolic rate of 3500 you're already at 5500 calories that's not that's about... He said he does no added fats. He said he only gets his fats from his protein, and he mostly eats. He said he eats beef, chicken, and protein powder. And then uh, he said he's doing uh, uh, chicken, chicken rice repeat, beef meat rice repeat, and sounds. <laughs> yeah, I know it was really funny familiar. He, <laughs> yeah, he said uh, 100 grams of protein per meal, uh, 200 grams of carbs per meal. That's what Jesus he does. Jesus Christ! That's a. Uh... I used. To, I was never an added fats guy for myself. I add them with clients because. In my experience, people just feel better with them. I mean, the anti-inflammatory effects, the omega-3 fatty acids are helpful because when you're not adding fats and the only fats you're getting are what's in your meats, you know, you're getting a lot of omega-6 and omega-9 fats, which actually are good, you know, as far as hypertrophy, you know, like the like arachidonic acid is one of the kind of the drivers of that, but that, you know, and, and, and hypertrophy is an inflammatory process, but I always worry about long-term health and then people do report they feel better when they've had some added fats in a diet. Anyone who's dieted with me at the end, if I pull their fats, that's when you really see the difference. But I, I never really liked the added fats. Uh, when I competed, it was just easier to just do, you know, meat and rice, chicken, rice, flank steak and rice. Just what was crazy. He was telling us that he doesn't run any train on contest prep. I'm like, I thought everybody ran. Trail you know, you know, I never, I couldn't, I, uh, I'm in, insanely prolactin sensitive. It, uh, it makes me like my skin gets like a three inch thick layer of water instantly. And my buddy, Brad from the old days of muscle mentor, he could tell you because one time, I don't know if he didn't believe me or if I probably just wanted to run it. I ran it to show and it's like it's it's almost instant like i'm just so so prolactin sensitive he was he was saying though he was using uh two bottles of gh sometimes three on a good day <laughs> per day yeah, yeah i mean things you know things starting to make a little more sense now you're training <laughs> twice a day six days a week <laughs> using multiple bottles of GH. It makes a little more sense then but but he was mostly he said he's just running test and prima bowling yeah that's yeah i mean hey 
preaching to the choir. Yeah, I mean, seriously, it's a uh, that I mean, anyone who's worked with me and anyone who's listened to your stuff knows it's like you, you know the 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 basic stuff works. The you know the injectables they're the least risk in general. You know the orals are going to spike your blood pressure. You're going to have fluctuating hormone levels. They tend to kill appetite. They give you the GERD. You know, give you acid reflux. Yeah, eat some no orals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, and the, you know, t- test and primo. Primo is really safe. It's pretty anti-estrogenic, so it probably never has to run an AI or anything. So, his, and his estrogen's probably not in a bottomed out. It's probably in a good range, which is going to help his cholesterol. He's the only thing he's really doing all oh, the GH, but the test is going to affect blood pressure that much. He's not getting blood pressure spikes from the orals. Like that's what you know. I've been preaching for years. Is that's that's the way to go. Test anabolic GH insulin, and then find kind of your upper limit to where you feel sluggish or it starts affecting your appetite. You and want that, to hear about the diet dedication? He was telling us he was in the hospital for two weeks after his hip hip surgery. Yeah, and he's like, the food sucks. He said, so I had my wife bringing me. He said she was bringing me a kilogram of chicken every day, and he he had his had his rice there at the hospital with him. I believe that. I believe I've heard he's uh, never, ever off plan. Heard he's that way. Uh, A weird one that I used to hear back in the day would be Paul Dillette. Uh, It was, was it Paul or Chris? No, it was Paul Dillette. And it was uh, then, I think Tom Prince said that was like his genetics were insane, you know, and people would say he didn't train hard, but he never, ever ate non-bodybuilding. It was just every meal. If they went out to eat even, it was he was ordering, you know, top sirloin and a plain baked potato or whatever yeah i mean that's usually what i do for my cheap cheap meals i i hit the uh although here lately i've been having trouble getting my food in uh i I, i'll go to i usually go to texas roadhouse and i'll just get a steak and two baked potatoes (laughs) that's my cheap meal yeah i don't don't even know if you really call it a cheap bad all right, you ever talk about to... the worst steak I ever had? <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time you're down here, I'm taking you for a good steak, man. There's an awesome steakhouse here. Yeah, yeah. We'll get a good some steak is a second. Oh, yeah. All right, let's get some questions. Uh, all right, Eric here wants to know, what are your favorite carb sources? I know this one. Rice. Rice, rice-based sources. There's very low, very few rice allergies. Easy to digest. Uh, it doesn't tend to cause gas. Uh, I mean that, you know, so rice, cream of rice, uh, rice noodles. That's my favorite. Cause yeah, you, you like potatoes, you're running in with the skin can, the, the fiber in the skin can cause uh, gas and that can make it harder to eat. Potatoes are pretty high in potassium, which for a normal diet isn't a big deal. But if you're eating something like what Roman Fritz does, if you're eating that many carbs from potatoes, you're going to go hyperkalemic and, and hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia is very dangerous if you exercise because that. Uh, high potassium levels uh, and high heart rate put you at a risk for going into ventricular tachycardia, which is like a precursor for a type of heart attack, like where your heart, ventricular fibrillation, a type of heart attack where they put a defibrillator on you and say clear. So yeah, I learned. I learned recently. This is something I didn't know until recently. Everybody's running telmisartan now for uh, for blood pressure, and telmisartan actually causes increases in 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 potassium. So you have to be really careful with potassium. With uh, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I was noticing a lot of guys showing up with high potassium on their blood work, and it was from it, it, it was from the Thomas Arden and then eating potatoes and bananas yeah, and crap like yeah. that. Yeah, I see it with potatoes. Yeah, that's interesting, and that's dangerous too because uh, one, you know one of the side effects of reduced kidney function is your potassium is going to climb too, and that's one of the bad side effects. Yeah, so you have to be careful with Thomas Arden in, in the potatoes. I, I potatoes just give me acid reflux really bad. I, I there's only so many I can have. It's so um, hard to eat. 100 grams of carbs from rice, two big, like two heaping scoops of cups of rice. I can like add a little beef broth, some salt and some red pepper, mix ground beef into that. I'm like eight spoonfuls and I've had 50 grams of protein and 100 grams of carbs. 100 grams of carbs from potatoes. It's like 20 ounces of potatoes. You know, like, first of all, even in the microwave, that takes like 25 minutes to cook <laughs> and then takes another three days to cool down to where you can actually eat it. And then you got, you know, 20 ounces of potatoes to eat. Yeah, with me, I, I have been, um, I've been doing mostly rice, cream of rice, and specifically with the rice, I think I, I see a lot of guys that are pounding the brown rice. I, I just, brown, oh, brown no. rice is stupid. So, well, it's just, the, it's white rice with the husk, and that husk we don't digest. It's, it's like an undigestible fibrous husk that's good, you know, like, because you got this 
going this this husky this husk going through your gut that's kind of you know going to potentially pull stuff through, but I, I don't think it's worth it, especially at the large volumes. Because what are you thirty five grams of carbs per cup? You're, you're not going to be a two hundred ninety pound off season bodybuilder eating brown rice, or if you are. I feel very terrible for whoever has to live with you and your absolutely <laughs> insane gas. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be terrible. And, and, and another thing too, um, like I noticed like uh, some guys, like uh, this is another one that people don't consider uh, basmati rice. Like I used to eat a lot of that, but it's, it's way, I mean, you have to eat like, it's like a cup and a half per, yeah. per what, what a cup of uh, jasmine rice would be. Yeah. It's a good switch and prep though. But... Yeah, it is. I'll make that switch and prep or sometimes, and prep I, this was a trick i learned from dr todd but i'll i'll start subbing out peas for uh for rice or or doing a blend of both because the yeah. peas it's, it's almost half ha, like a cup of peas is about half the carbs of what what's in a cup of rice That's so you funny. get the same volume yeah what i used to do i don't do it really that much anymore but for years what i used to have clients do as a way to taper carbs was i would say they were eating you know 50 grams of carbs per meal and then we'd make a change and i'd say uh, keep your normal source for 25 grams. And then for the other 25 grams can change that to peas or carrots or green beans, like a higher carb vegetable. That would be the same volume, you know, you, you know, so you're actually eating more volume of food, but the carbs would be lower. And then the next change would we be, we would change to all of those vegetable sources. And then the final change would we, we'd switch from like peas or peas or corn because corn is like two, Two thirds as much as rice, but you know we switch from that to like green fibrous vegetables like broccoli or, or cauliflower, and so the entire time you never eat less food volume, but your calorie count is consistently dropping. I don't really do that much anymore. I like to be a little more precise than just you know cut it in half, but it's it's a good way to do it. Yeah, I mean I'm a prep. I'm way into measuring everything, but I I, I have been futzing around with food volume, cauliflower rice, and stuff like that. Sometimes I'll use, well, although the cauliflower rice upsets my stomach. I ate 2006 prep. I ate a, a lifetime supply of cauliflower. I still struggled <laughs> to get to get near that stuff. Uh, that's funny. Uh, all right, let's get this one. That was a good one. All right, Justin, can you talk about your trading philosophy? I know you're a fan of DC and love hearing you speak on it. Also, you should make more workout videos for your channel. I, know, I need to work out more. <laughs> I, I want to. I want. I'm in. I'm in that. I mean, I'm coaching a lot of people right now. Very high level amount of coaching, which I I enjoy. I love doing it. But I'm taking on a lot of clients. Uh, we have Team Troponin, which is a lot of extra work, and then First Attachment, which is a whole company with logistics and shipping issues, and uh, and you know, and then uh, we own commercial property also, which we're selling off because things are just just absolute insanity i actually got a i didn't even realize i was i text one our marketing manager something last night as i was finishing up work uh and i wake up this morning and he, he commented it was 3 a.m you know on a, <laughs> on a saturday because it's like it's just uh, and i know you're in a similar boat right now with what, what your workload paul but just absolute madness it's hard to really because there's a difference between and we talked about this too there's a difference between training and working out I'm like right now I'm working out and I'm getting my workouts in, but like when I'm training and really making progress, like that's the main thing for my day. I, you know, I think about it, I plan for it, I eat my meals around it. I'm hyper-focused for it. And that's, yep. you know, that's where you get the good workouts right now. It can't be the main thing of my day. It's the, okay, it's time. I run down cause we have a home gym. I run downstairs. I get, I, you know, I check my boxes. I get my workouts in, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, but anyway, from training philosophy as a, uh, uh I try to keep things like, like first principles, what do we know can't not work, you know, like almost like a Warren Buffett style of investing, you know, like don't rather than like shoot the moon on things, go for something that you, you, you know, you can't miss on. And so you can, you can imagine that if you're deadlifting 300 pounds for 10 or 200 pounds for 10 right now, and in 10 years, you're deadlifting 585 for 10, there's no way your back isn't going to be bigger. There, there just isn't, you know? Now, that might not be the most optimal way to th grow back thickness, but you know that's the case. And so that's basically what I try to do is I try to pick, I don't, but I don't do movements. I try to pick movements that work a muscle, make sure that muscle is doing the work. And then I try to increase the weight on that movement, provided that the muscle still does the work. 
Uh, but I, but there's also sarcoplasmic growth, which is more volume related. Mm -hmm. And I get I get like tied to DC and like low volume more than uh, I think I deserve. Because like if anyone's bought my critical mass program, you'll see that it's not low volume. Those are those are long ass workouts. No, that's right. It's they're pretty long workouts. Yeah, I mean, there's there's progressive overload. There's there's sets where you do where you work up to one heavy all out set where you're trying to set a PR each workout. But then there's a lot of additional sets also. So, so but my training philosophy is basically that I don't know exactly what builds muscle. But it, rather than just go in and move weight around and hope something happens, I like to find some way to make some trackable metric. And for me, that was progressing in weight, provided that I didn't change my form on a movement. I didn't rest longer before the heavy set. I didn't change, you know, do anything to give myself a mechanical advantage. You know, I got stronger because I was actually, the muscle actually got stronger. And it doesn't happen every workout, but over time it does. And again, you know, like, you're not going to find a guy deadlifting 585 for sets of 10 conventional who doesn't have some back thickness or or as at least have a thicker back than he used to. And then really my training philosophy is that that's what you do so that the food can make you bigger because the food does all the work. It's funny your your style of training was almost to a T how I was training when I when I met met up with you and I, I bought your book and I looked at it I'm like like this is my fucking workout man it's almost exact <laughs> it's almost the exact same workout I I do more volume now I think people get confused like they think I'm not I'm not doing progressive overlay it's just uh I don't know how much you've looked at like Dr Mike Israel tells stuff yeah. uh -huh. but it's it's more. And I heard, I heard when you were on with Stan Efforting, he was talking about how he's training like that now. But it's, yeah, it's, and mine, mine's changed that way a lot more as I get older. You know, it's just it hurts I, a lot more. Yeah, I think for a young guy, I think I, I, training age plays a plays a, a factor into it. Like for a young guy, I feel like it's progressive overload, just get stronger, learn how to lift properly. It's 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 a different it's a different way, but like now, like my, my block, I'll take blocks. I'll take, although I'm hurt now, I can't really do it, but I'll take like a five or six week block and I'll take a weight, a weight. And then I progress the volume up. I finish that block and then I'll add more weight to it. So it's, it's still progressive overload. It's just that you're progressing volume on a given weight. And then when you hit a cap on that weight, then you move the weight up. Yeah. And, and in general, uh, in general, I think people worry way too much about training I do too. What is, you know, everyone at the gym is training, you know, and everyone, the first thing they get interested in is training and designing workouts. And I remember being in like high school and like in my notebook, like planning out my workouts. And that's the first thing everyone gets excited about is training. That's the first thing everyone tries to get really good at. And everyone in the gym is doing it, but not everyone in the gym is big. So and then the next thing they try usually is, is, at, at, you know, anabolics, PEDs, and they get bigger. But not everyone in the gym looks like a bodybuilder or a top level power lifter or whatever. And most of them are using PEDs and training. And so then there's a third variable that the, the, the fewer people are doing. And that's the, like what we just talked about with Roman Fritz, the ones that are eating obsessively and not just eating pizza and people. And I was I was a, the, it was took me eight years to, to kind of finally accept that fact because I, I'm a fat guy naturally. I don't like chicken and rice. I mean, no, I don't think anyone does. Nobody I like eating does. and I have a big appetite and I like to eat, you know, it's very easy to convince myself that eating big to get big, you know, was, was a thing, but it, uh, it, you don't look like a bodybuilder until you eat like a bodybuilder. And if you eat like a bodybuilder and train like a pussy, You'll, you'll still probably look like a bodybuilder. If you train like an animal and eat like shit, you're probably not going to look like a bodybuilder. I mean, pa Paul Dillette is an example of that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, exactly. a lot of the young guys probably don't know who he is, but uh, he, he had a reputation for being sort of soft with his training, but meticulous with his diet. I mean, yeah. that's what yeah. I heard. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, always would never, uh, no matter what, never. Uh, yeah, uh, Bob Chicarillo used to talk about that. They'd go, you know, like, middle of the off season anywhere traveling doing an expo order the same food at the restaurant you know ground sirloin and a, or t sirloin tip and a plain baked potato yeah supposedly he was meticulous with it. but you can look at there's a sample size if you just take i don't know why people it's it's right there for you all you have to do is look at what all the pro bodybuilders are doing and like 
training wise it's like it's all over the place there's but but for the most part most of the guys are, are doing some sort of a bro split or push pull legs yeah. mm-hmm. that that's that's pretty much the routine they, they they do there's some people that do high volume there's some people that do low volume some people that use heavy weights some people that don't but the one thing you see in the pro ranks that's consistent is the ped use it, it's pretty much similar between all the guys and the diet <laughs> that that's that's pretty consistent yeah and the, the 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 other thing, like I like to do the numbers. You can you can run numbers on all all these things. So they estimate that as many as three million Americans use PEDs in a given year, and so there's like 350 million Americans. But let's just to round it to make it easy, say 300 million Americans. So that's one in a hundred Americans use PEDs in any given year. One in a hundred. Now, 98 percent of the people that use PEDs are going to be male, probably. So. You're talking like h- half that population, one in 150 now, or I mean, uh, one in 50 people use PEDs. And now that's everyone. That's counting two-year-old boys and 98-year-old men. If you break it down to like 18 to 55-year-old, the people who actually use them, what are you, what are you looking at? Uh, you know, 75 million Americans. And so three out of 75, uh, uh, what, what's that ratio? One in, wow, well, and I, I physics graduate degree i'm terrible one in 25 yeah one in, so one in 25 men in this country use peds do one, how many people consistently go to a gym even about one in 25 right you know so, so, like so every- everyone everyone at the gym is using not everyone but you know the only ones who aren't are the young kids who haven't are kind of learned about it yet but maybe haven't taken the step and think that's the magic secret but really like one if you do run the numbers one in 25 18 to 55 year old males in america will will touch a PED at some point in the year. One in 25 men don't look like a bodybuilder. So obviously you have to use those to, to look like one, and that's a major part of the equation, but it's not the, the solution to the equation. I see guys on gear all the time that don't look like bodybuilders. And it's funny, like you get people on a diet, and within 16 weeks they look like a different person. Yeah, yeah. And people this feel is- probably already commenting, like, oh, you think they're, they're, they're always pushing the PD? It's like, no, you have to take them. I'm just saying there's more to the equation. Don't just do that. You're, you're wasting your money if you just do that and think that's that's the only thing. Because you're you're one of you're already in the one of 25 group. And there's there's a what's a what's a one out of 25? What, what did we say it was? Three, three out of 75. Three out of 75 yeah. How many millions? Yeah. So that's. How many million men is that that use PD? Or, or it is three. Never mind. My brain's fried right now. But yeah, there's three million men in America that use PDs, and there aren't three million bodybuilders. This is a one I can I can talk to. Somebody was asking, is Dante Trudell strict with nutrition? I uh, I trained with him for three years. I was God, it was 2002 to 2005. I'm sure he's completely different with the diet now. But I remember he was. He was big on the protein in olive oil shakes, man, and they would make me shit my pants. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a what's the, the olive oil because that's because not all the fat will get digested in large chunks of oils. And uh, remember Olestra, those like those yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that very well. <laughs> yeah, so or orange roughy, <laughs> you know, there's like you'll you'll get that some of that fat won't if you're drinking large amounts at a time, you don't extract every calorie from it. And some of it, some of that oil will pass all the way through. And then when that oil gets the, the colon, it's an oil slick. <laughs> so. Yeah. He would, I remember he would do, he would do sort of like a carb front loading where we would eat carbs the first half of the day. And then, and then the, the fats and, and protein the second half of the day. And like half the protein came from protein powder um and then and then uh i remember he used to have me do some crazy shit post-workout like i'd go get like four double cheeseburgers and a in a in a milkshake from mcdonald's and throw a scoop of protein powder yeah we got it like with with, with dante is like it's it's cool because he made it like a little niche that's still around and he doesn't Mm -hmm. post much at all anymore and people are still what they're interested in it because it's so different but what dante was doing was he wasn't working with someone who was prepping for the new york pro you know, he was working with the, he was talking to 21 year old guys. kids who were yeah. still 118 pounds, or 145 pounds, you know, and didn't want to be that way anymore. And he said, you know, if you don't, if you're 100, if you're, you know, 22 years old and 145 pounds, and you don't want to be 145 pounds. Then what you do is you go in the gym and lift really, really, really heavy and keep trying to get stronger and then eat a lot of food, basically what it was. Yeah. And I remember when I, when I would want to diet or anything, he would have me hook up a skip anyway yeah. he would just he would just like yeah. talk to skip 
Yeah, because he was just he liked putting size on people. That's yeah, he like he liked the training, and it was a uh, very 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 moderate PED use with him. I remember like it was like almost nothing. I would just like run a little test and deck up. It wasn't anything. It wasn't anything. Um, I definitely got bigger. I I, I grew a lot. I got fat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, and I think Dante was PD because I think he got a lot of. He said like 2002, 2003, he did the cycles for pennies in 2000, 2001, and mm -hmm. I think he mentioned a gram of test maybe and got like because people got a ton of flack and people like lost their mind on that thread. It ended up being like a like a thousand page thread, but uh, so I think he like really like pulled back, like even mentioned his. He was never like. He was always light with PEDs, but he, I think he could pull back even a little further after that just to avoid the, excuse me, avoid the hassle. Yeah, I took the cycle for pennies and um, revised it and kind of cleaned it up. I, I have a copy of it to download on my website if anybody's interested. So if you're interested, I still talk to him occasionally, but he, he posts yeah, some yeah. stuff up on his blog blog now and then but uh yeah i mean he was all, i don't know i don't the diet wasn't really his thing he would just he was he was just eat a lot of food eat a lot I think he was a two gram per pound of body weight yeah. protein guy i do I'd like but all the guys back then were I, I think that's sort of evolved and changed now people yeah, realize you don't need yeah. as much protein and it, it's it's evolved because back then you were you were on a message board talking to everyone you know and so you, you you like you had to be a little more general you know i i was never a fan of that much protein but you, you you needed to get all these kids who don't listen to anything and are eating zero protein basically you know eating cereal for breakfast eating whatever is like available on at the campus cafeteria for lunch and then getting some beers and pizza at night you know and so really really emphasizing the protein it was it was who the people he was talking to were, were anonymous people on the internet it wasn't yeah. you know i mean he 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 was sort of still pretty similar in the people he coached, but it was a lot of the stuff people see from him that you got to take into consideration. That's what he's talking to. If you got a, you know, an 18 year old kid who weighs 104 pounds and he wants to get bigger, you know, and you don't work, he's not paying you. You just got, you have like three sentences to tell him what to do. It's, you're going to say, get really friggin' strong, eat a shit ton of protein and, and then get a lot of calories. Yeah, I, I mean, I blew up when I was with him. I remember I went from like 200 pounds up to like 270 over the course of a couple of years. I definitely got bigger, um, and I, I put I put a lot of muscle on, and then I completely stopped lifting and got fat. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what happened. There. What happened to me? Uh, all right, so Bobby Wall, uh, vigorous Steve said, guys using peanut butter for added fats ended up less lean than guys who used other sources. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, because not not because on a calorie for calorie basis, peanut butter is any different. It's because you give someone seven grams. Like I give I give fats in certain amounts because they link to my foods I like to use. You know, most nut butters are seven grams of fat per tablespoon. Per tablespoon. You tell yeah. someone to eat tub, seven grams of fat from peanut butter. A level tablespoon is like the bigger spoon in your drawer. You know, you have the smaller spoon, the bigger spoon. I mean, you, know, you might know what a tablespoon actually is, but it's about that leveled off. <laughs> that's not very much peanut butter people take a they think a tablespoon of peanut butter is a spoonful of peanut butter that seven grams of fat is probably closer to 30 and then there's also carbs and protein in the in the peanuts and so that's why it's pe and then and then it tastes so goddamn good it's it's if there's one food that's difficult to stop eating uh after you started on a prep it's peanut butter or, or almond butter so, you know, like that, that, that's the thing, you know, like 10 grams of fat from an avocado is like half an avocado. You, 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 you take one spoonful of peanut butter to get 10 grams of fat. You basically have to level off that spoon, which no one does. Yeah, no, I, I've gotten to the point where I just don't even trust people with nut butters anymore. I don't even give it to them. The only I, time I do is when I want an error on the side of more calories rather than less which like i i in my peak plans i usually tell people to get their fats from nut butters is because by that point like we're you know if we're we're not trying to deplete and if i want to if, if we're erring on an either side because fats aren't carbs and so you're the way you fill out on them is a little different so if we're going to err on either side i'd rather them eat more than less i remember on that first contest prep when you gave me the uh almond butter on my peak it was like having sex man oh it's so good it's amazing <laughs> plain, how good that can taste plain plain almond butter and flank steak never tasted so good oh, in my man, life Justin. yeah yeah I've done, <laughs> I've, like, people i've seen pictures of people like oh my god it's so good and they'll they'll show me and they'll 
they'll have spread the peanut butter over the flank steak. I'm like, man, dieting <laughs> brain, dieting <laughs> appetite is just a different I, beast. Yeah, you, you know, you know, you're in contest prep, deep in contest prep when the Walden Farms stuff starts yeah, tasting oh, good. Yeah, oh god, I can't even. That's just so gross. Some of the stuff you eat with you when you eat in the off season, you're like, what was I thinking? Like oatmeal, oatmeal with some Splenda is like a like heaven you know it's like oh my god this is so good. i can't believe i'm eating this this is the greatest thing ever you like plain oatmeal or splenda right now i'd be like oh what is there's nothing in this what am i eating oh my god i was eating i was eating sugar-free jellos and and pickles like it was going out of style oh yeah cucumbers and salt uh (laughs) cucumbers with balsamic vinegar yeah i mean i remember eating plain lettuce or just taking a whole head of lettuce chopping it up and putting some balsamic vinegar in it and just uh, being in heaven. <laughs> of course, my stomach would just be in hell afterwards, but. This one's a classic. Justin, how did you manage to do the Widowmaker set with 500 pound squats? I can't imagine how brutal that would be. That That is a legend. I remember seeing that many, it was shit, that was like 20 years ago, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I was, because uh, we didn't, I wish I got more videos of those things. It was, it was hard. I didn't know. I didn't know any better. Uh, I have an interesting training background because I started working out just by myself at first, you know, and reading like the Weeder magazines. And I think one of the first, and I bought a book and it was like John Defendus's book or a book or Steve Michelak, Insanity Over Intensity Over Insanity or whatever, where it was like just so much workload. And I thought that's how you train. And then I met another guy, uh, Mike Hickey, and that's who I trained with in high school and through college. And he trained like he, the guy was an absolute animal. He was a division one football player. And just like we would train just, just stupid hard. I didn't know any different. Uh, and we, I trained at a little gym called the Birchwood Athletic Club. We called it courtrooms, which was literally racquetball court with like a little weight center. And then, uh, and then my next training partner was Steve Kuklo and uh, my bar- business partner with First Attachment, Joe Miller. And I, we just kept training that way. It wasn't until like I stopped training with all those people and trained with other people that I realized that, like that that wasn't just what you did. So I, I don't know. It was uh it was hard hard on the lungs. I mean I I think I almost died one time actually. I'm 99 percent sure I went into AFib and hopefully not v, <laughs> VTAC. But uh my heart rate was well over 200 beats a minute and it was like uncontrolled and I couldn't really breathe. But uh, yeah, I just didn't didn't know any better. I like. <laughs> <laughs> that's you isn't it yeah yeah and i just like there was a time at that time that time there when my when i could my shoulders were flexible enough that i could still bring my hands in away from the plates later on i lost that flexibility and my hands would have to be all the way at the plates and i wasn't as stable but when i could squat like that i felt like i was i felt like i mean like i'm wearing a like a velcro belt no knee wraps i felt like i was born to squat it was uh and and the the reason my hips are bad is because when I'd reach the bottom, there would be a ton of pressure on my hips so much so that it was hard to even stay in the bottom. Yeah. I can see the, I can see you flaring at the bottom. Yeah. It would want to, it would want to push me out. So it almost felt like if I could get into that position, like anything, you know, like I had a thousand pounds of hip pressure that was pushing the weight up and I just had to catch it on the way up afterwards. I I mean, I miss those days because squatting doesn't feel that way anymore, but. Here's another one of you doing, um, Let's see here. Look at the baby face, Justin. <laughs> oh, wow. Six plates on the hack squat. Yeah, I think at least 20. One of these, I might do 40. I remember Dante was big on those Widowmaker sets. I, 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 did, I did do 405 for 20 at one point, but... Like I don't squat anymore, and people are asking me why I can't, why I don't squat. It's I just can't even. My, my shoulders are so fucked. I can't get my hands under the bar anymore. Yeah, it hurts. It, it hurts so much now. <laughs> but yeah, I just I, I used to. Yeah, I just used to really love doing. I can even see you getting the that hip flare on the yeah on, on the. Yeah, I mean it was obviously bad for my hips, but like it it was good for building quads <laughs> yeah i felt like i was just born born to born to squat all right uh let's see what we got here um yeah i think we talked about this would egg noodles suffice as a substitute for carbs besides rice yeah yeah fine with me yeah 
I mean, I, I go. That's another one of my cheat meals. I'll go get uh, Thai food, and I usually get uh, something with egg egg noodles uh, or or uh, most Thai Thai food. The the noodles are egg noodles. I think all of them are actually. Some will be rice, but yeah, it's the either or. Oh right, yeah, rice noodles. Sorry, yeah, they're rice noodles. Sorry, I'm yeah, Thai is my uh, one of my go tos. There's a place in town called Bangkok Flavor. It's one of those like hole in the wall places in a strip mall. You know, next to like a lover's lane. And you walk there and no one speaks English. That's the, I get either, I usually get pad thai or uh, peanut curry. Yeah, I mean, I rotate, I, I'll rotate between steak, kebabs, and then um, thai food. That's usually, I mean, I, I'm pretty predictable. Once in a while, I'll grab chipotle for a cheat meal. I use, I, I chipotle out, but yeah, I'm almost always sushi or thai food. Like my, much. Problem, my problem with chipotle is they skimp on the damn portions now. I go and, and then it's like twenty dollars to get a double portion. I'm like, I can go go to Texas Roadhouse and get a. Yeah, oh yeah. Have you ordered like Grubhub or DoorDash or anything with the Chipotle? I, yeah. I did it two or three times, and they they skimp. I don't know if they want you to if they hate those kind of orders. But finally, by the third one, when I got like three little pieces of steak, and I was like, "This is ridiculous. I'll never order it from there again." They, the the portions were just absolutely absurd. Yeah, I get like two ounces of meat, and I'm like, "What the yeah. fuck is this?" Like, and I, go to, I just, I don't, I'm not trying to cheat you. It's like charge me. I'm just, just give me the food. And I'll go to, I'll go to Texas Roadhouse. I can get a 14 ounce sirloin for for 20 bucks. Yeah, yeah, same price. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's see what we got uh, on here. Uh, my buddy Dave says, "What's up, blue collar so, bodybuilder?" Hey, blue collar bodybuilder. All right, I like it um uh, let's see all right here's a good one if you eat ten thousand calories how much is not used versus excreted well ten thousand is tough to say uh i i always read or i remember reading that because because the, the gut breaks down some of the back some of the calories and i always read that it was like 10 like three to ten percent so somewhere to let like the bacteria in the gut will kind of break down the calories to a non-absorbable state and they won't get absorbed and that's say 10 percent. i saw once somewhere mention uh si as much as 67 percent, and i would have to assume that would be for like a nathan's hot dog eating contest so what i would imagine that is food volume related you know if you ate 10,000 calories in one meal that food's going to sit in the gut so long the bacteria is going to break down more uh but it, it, if we just say let's say 10 percent right there just in the bacteria then you're at 9,000 calories is what you're actually getting but then it's going to depend on the macros because if it was 10,000 calories of protein, you know, the, you have these protein structures, they go through the stomach. The first thing that happens in the small intestine is you don't absorb protein, you absorb amino acids. So the body has to break apart the bonds of the amino, of the large amino structures into like di or tripeptide bonds. And, you know, anytime you break anything, you know, if I want to snap a, a rope, it takes energy, you know. And so and then, and then when that's digested, a lot of that protein gets converted to carbs through gluconeogenesis and some of those carbs are converted to fat to the fatty acid synthesis pathway. And so you're probably looking at maybe 15%. I mean, I've seen, I think like uh, Scott Stevens said, he saw one time there was a study as much as 30%, but I think about 15% is pretty safe bet. So 15% of the calories, if it was all protein would be not absorbed because of those processes. And then 10% because of the gut bacteria. So you got 75% uh, of that. So 7,500 calories of the protein would be, or, 2,500 calories of the protein would be not utilized in that case. All right. We got a cardio question here. I know you're a hit cardio fan, but uh, what well, are your I'm thoughts? Fan. I hate hit cardio. I just know it works. <laughs> <laughs> what, are your, what are your thoughts on steady state cardio, like walking on the treadmill, full incline, three miles per hour versus elliptical for 30 minutes with high resistance? <laughs> what, what, how are you walking on the treadmill? Are you, doing, are you walking like a zombie? Are you holding on to the front and, le <laughs> and leaning your body back? So, you know, this is this is my ten percent incline. You know, I'm 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 at a zero percent incline. If like if anyone has gone on like on a vacation and like walk, done Machu Picchu or something like that, <laughs> you know, knows how exhausting thirty minutes climbing at a at a at a high incline is. The reason I don't like doing just steady state cardio with an incline on a treadmill is people. Uh, you can tell people not to hold on they hold on 
you know, and they even might have good intention of never holding on, but they start getting real little tired and they rest for a little bit or they put their arms up or they kind of press and just kind of, you know, take some pressure off their spine or half the time they hold on to the front of the thing the whole time and lean back. So like a full incline, a 15%, uh, <laughs> like most inclines go to 15%. So if you're talking about full incline at three miles an hour, 15% at three miles an hour, that's not steady state. That's high intensity. That's brutal if you're not holding on. You know, yeah. at fifty percent incline. So I, I mean, that that's why I don't like. The, one of the reasons I just do hit is the and the way I do it is I do one minute hard, one minute light. It's bodybuilder hit because our high rep sets of bodybuilding, like the widowmaker sets on squats, are about one minute sets, and so I want to make sure that our cardio is used to being able to output at high intensity for about a minute, so that our lungs. Lungs are never the failure point on an exercise and it burns more calories and it sort of self-regulates, you know, because even if you are holding on, then you got to increase the mile per hour. You got to do something to make it hard for that minute. But uh, for, if I do steady state, I usually just, I, I don't trust people like, no, I mean, uh, there are people probably on here who are in amazing shape who can do that. But most bodybuilders I'm working with are, you know, north of 250 pounds you're not going to get a 294 pound guy doing 15 percent incline at three miles an hour without holding on so if it is he's holding on but at my i don't have anything against steady state and i do i move more to steady state with clients now because people just hate hit so much even when i know it's beneficial uh, but my steady state would be you know like i think if you're doing three miles an hour at a six percent incline you're probably do you know for 30 minutes for a heavy bodybuilder that that's i mean that's going to get me sweating pretty hard I, i'll be honest man i didn't do any of the hit cardio in my last contest prep <laughs> yeah it's, it's just, actually better for off season which people which is even harder to get people to understand yeah i do the, i do the hit in the off season half the time i'm terrible about it i but i i do I, i'll do hit i i usually uh um I'll either get on the bike or or the uh, elliptical, and I'll I'll do a I'll do a like a thirty thirty like thirty seconds slow, and then thirty seconds full blast full blast sprint. I like I like the bike. Yeah, honestly. I like the bike too. Uh, the bike. I mean, I like the step mill the most. But really, kind of where it first came about was uh, in two thousand six. I decided I wanted to stay leaner in the off season. I was going to do cardio all year. And I started just doing 20 minutes after every workout, except for legs. Uh, and then I just kind of would spice it up. And then, I, and then I started doing like hard bits, you know, like 30 seconds. And I realized eventually that when I did like hard, hard minutes, th th those were all those YouTube videos were, were, were during that period of time when I was doing hit. And that was the only time in my bodybuilding career where I could eat massive amounts of food and not get fat. I made the most rapid strength progress, the most rapid size progress because I could eat so much food and I, I had the appetite for it. And my metabolism was always flying. And my training was, you know, like you train with someone and they like do bent over rows and they quit at rep eight because not because they couldn't get another rep, but because the, they haven't been able to breathe. Yeah. It's like, well, how are you growing then? You know, like, I know you, I know you don't want to do cardio. I know people think cardio is going to make you small. I don't want to be a runner. You know, I don't, don't want to be a cardio bunny, but you're not growing when you run out of breath before your muscle fails on bent over rows or deadlifts or squats either. I was going to ask you about the step mill and contest prep. It seems like everybody does the damn step mill and contest prep. And what I've mm -hmm. seen, Every time, like, 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 I've seen a lot of guys when they do step mill on contest prep, they end up just completely nuking their legs. Their legs shrivel up. I I see the opposite, actually. I think really, I, yeah, because I see them shrivel up from from long duration treadmill cardio, huh. the most. I mean, it depends on what what how much you're doing, but I mean, I'll give I guess two two ways of looking at it. One, I'll say. Uh, if you watch the cost of redemption, Ronnie Coleman does 45 minutes on the step mill about two hours after he did that leg workout where he squatted 800 for two. And that was the off season. Kai green does 15 minutes of the step mill before every workout. And Kai green's legs. I mean, I haven't seen him in a while, but Kai green's legs at their peak were about, I mean, they, they were just impossibly enormous. Uh, and I, the, one of the reasons I like it is, uh, you know, you can't spot reduce. You can't pick where fat gets burned from. But the fat needs to, when it's oxidized, it needs to get into the bloodstream. 
you know, and if you just if you're just standing there and you put your hands on your on your butt, your butt skin's probably cold. It's not a high volume, high blood flow area. Same as your stomach, you know. And so by doing the the step mill, you're getting blood flow into that area of the glutes. And so as your body burns fat systemically, you can't pick where it burns. But now if it, there's now that there's blood flow to that area, it seems like it's probably more likely that some of that fat will be oxidized from the glutes and hamstrings where you want them to be. And then I find, I really, really do find, because I think the total step count. Now, this is a loaded question because what I'm picturing is a, is a bodybuilder doing uh, the step mill at a pretty low level. You know, I'm, I'm not picturing them doing it at level 15. I'm, I'm, I'm picturing like one of my super heavies doing like level two and three for their low, light minute and level six or nine on their hard minute, you know. Uh, and, uh, and then for their list, they probably are just walking. But when you're walking, if you're walking two hours a day, that's a lot of steps, a lot, a lot of low intensity. I mean, the opposite of what builds muscle, you know. A, you know, a lot of very, very high rep, low weight uh, workload on a muscle is, is the opposite of what builds a muscle. I mean, I it, it's funny, like you'll see cyclists, they've got gigantic quads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's that thought. I mean, you can over, obviously you can overdo it. If you're doing, you know, 30 minutes on the step mill twice a day, six days a week at, at you know, at, on level 10, that's probably, you know, you're going to eat it. I mean, maybe not eat up muscle tissue, but that's a lot of your, mu that's a lot to ask of your quads and glutes. But if you do it where the way I do it with shorter duration and I'm not expecting you to go and, you know, half, half the time you're doing it, I'm expecting you to barely be moving like a level two or three, you know, for, for my like larger bodybuilders. Yeah, I, I uh, mostly most of my cardio I do on the elliptical. I just find I'm old and beat up. My knees and hips hurt, and I just find the elliptical is is the easiest on my on my joints. Yeah, the uh, I I do I used to do the step mill quite a bit actually, and I would do like my hit. I would do five for my slow part, and then ten, twelve for my faster part. Yeah, so that's pretty high for. Well, you're probably lighter then, but I, that's yeah. that's pretty high. You know, my, my issue with the step mill, Justin, is I, I wear my, my shoe size is almost a 16. Yeah. And, and like my damn feet, my feet don't fit on the fucking 14. Uh, yeah. That's what I think. You know what I always think too? Walking downstairs. Like if I'm at a, like just at some place where there's a lot of stairs. So I'm a 14. I always think like, how does Shaq, uh, walk? <laughs> because you can't land on your toe, like the ball of your foot. Cause your ball of no. your foot are so like, you got to like heel land all the way down or like turn, turn your foot like duck walk. I yeah, I like, have to like duck walk sometimes. Yeah, if you got like a 20 size 20, how does that work? Those guys are because I always feel like I'm like, I'm like, you know, like right on the edge of America's Funniest Home Videos embarrassment of sliding down the stairs because I'm always just that heel landing right on the edge. There was a guy here asking about like the calorie counter on the, on the, uh, on the cardio machine. I don't trust any of that shit. I don't, I don't know. Trust, how it... Well, you got to, if you put your weight correctly on it, it's probably somewhat close. But if it doesn't let you put your weight, don't it could it doesn't need, the number means nothing. But if it lets you put your weight, I, it's not like I would I wouldn't trust it in that I'm gonna I'm going to say uh, I ate at my BMR and the cardio counter says I burned 500 calories, therefore I'm gonna burn one pound of fat a week. But what do you I did 500 calories and I increased it to 600? I would trust that I burned more calories. What do you do with guys that are that have a physical job? I I've been having guys like like, like I have guys that do construct. I have one guy who works. He builds ships. He's yeah. like, like he is constantly moving. So people like that, I, I I've been having them wear like either a Fitbit or an Apple Watch and just track steps. Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, I I've been I go through. You know, I always go through phases. I've been done this so long. Like you just because so many things work. You know, and it's just kind of like what you're like into using i guess but i've been using a step count a lot more the problem is is uh like not everyone can be a top bodybuilder and it, there's more than just genetics you know if you're working a construction job where you're working six twelves and you're doing twenty three thousand steps a day it's good you, you you genetics aside you got a, a uphill battle of becoming a top bodybuilder you know people it's like some, you know, like you do what you can, but people like, it's so weird with a sport that people don't consider those things, you know, like no one, no one decides like, you know what, I want to play left tackle for the Detroit lions. And, and 
and think, well, uh, you know, I'm not six, eight, three thirty, So it's probably not going to happen, you know, but, but if I work really hard or no one thinks, you know, like, you know what, I'm going to be the best, I'm going to be a pro NBA basketball player. All I got to do is take steroids and dribble a lot. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, or, or I want to, you know, I want to be a pitcher in the majors. All I got to do is take steroids. Yeah. You take steroids and you, you go from throwing, you know, 64 miles an hour to 67 and you get a good pitching coach. You're going, you're going to throw 69. You ain't making the majors. You know, there's, there are genetic components that it's frustrating because in this sport, PEDs play such a big role that people want to just completely ignore the genetic components. But, you know, like people know why LeBron James is, you know, a good basketball player and no one would expect otherwise, you know, and no one, you know, like Mike Tyson just had quick, heavy hands for whatever reason, you know, and that wasn't, you know, it's not like like Joe Tyson down the street and could take some PEDs and, and punch like that. I know so we've talked about, We've talked about it before and, and with the genetics, but like uh, basketball is the most obvious example of it. I mean, you yeah. can look at it. I, I, th- I think uh, we talked about it before, like the median height, I think, in the NBA is like six, seven, six, eight. Yeah. And that's like a fraction standard, of 1%. Yeah. Yeah, it's think, like one in 1,000 people or something. Yeah, there. two standard deviations or something from the norm, which is about what probably all sports are. Like in, for bodybuilding, yeah. for the most part, the, the bodybuilders who are – like doing well in shows like the pro bodybuilders who are legitimate pros meaning they're earning income from competing are probably two standard deviations from the norm as far as their ability to build muscle mass you know their their various like levels of like myostat and, and you know it's just the way it is you know it's just the way it is and if you don't believe it like you'll learn it when it, it, most people haven't believed it have never just got the chance to watch one of those genetics genetic people come up the ranks, you know, look at your gym. Like if, if one of those kids join your gyms at age 20 and at age 23, he's 310 pounds and, you know, doing nationals and you watched him gain muscle almost daily, you, you, you see the difference. I mean, it, it, yeah. I mean, it's, you'll know instantly when, when somebody, I mean, you, 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 you I mean, you met that one kid at my gym that was uh, yeah, oh, yeah, only yeah. been lifting for two years. <laughs> yeah, not, doesn't know how to eat. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and he's already like 290. Yeah. I mean, it's like, that's what Steve Kukla was like. When I met him, someone had been telling him about he should get in touch with me because he lived in the same area about, you know, bodybuilding and coaching. And so at the time I was out, because I was a baby myself, but, you know, he was like 17. I was 22 or 23. Uh, he came to my apartment. And I, I tell this story all the time. I don't have a piece of paper, but he came in with like this printout from bodybuilding.com and in walks this 220 pound kid with abs, round muscles, massive calves, looks like he's already ready to win a bodybuilding show. And he's like, uh, yeah, I want, uh, someone told me about you. I want to be a bodybuilder. He said, I printed this out. Uh, it says you're supposed to eat chicken, a lot of chicken, you know? And it's like, this guy, th- the only weight training he's done is whatever they do for hockey. He doesn't know what a PED is. You know, it doesn't even, you know, he's just now learning that chicken has protein in it and he's already 220 pounds lean at 17 or 18. And speed is another example of genetics. Yeah, like yeah. I, I play, I play basketball and I remember, you know, I was pretty quick. I think I ran like a four, six, four, seven, something like that when I was in college. I mean, which people don't realize how fast that is, but then, then there's like, I remember this one, one kid who ended up being a, a, a punt returner for the, uh, for the Patriots that, that we used to play basketball with and he could run a four, three. And that was just like another level of fast. So man. I have the exact same story. Cause I was really fast for my size. Uh, I mean, I played division three football, uh, it's low level. I was a late bloomer. If, you know, if I was, if my parents held me, if I got held back one year, I probably would have got to play at a good school, but I was a late bloom, bloomer. I was two time all American, but anyway, long story short, I, I was, uh, I think I had the second or third fastest 40 on our team as a defensive lineman, defensive end. Uh, my, the three I ran my senior year. Uh, and the reason I remember is because the media was there and they put it in the newspaper. And so I had the cutout. It was, uh, uh four, seven, two, four, seven, one and four, six, eight. And so I run a four seven. Well, so I went to the NFL combines, like the big ones, not the like the ones on ESPN, but the ones for it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll entertain you. You know, is that Ohio State's indoor facility? It's like, well, we'll watch you. Maybe there's some freak out there. And there was a guy there, a wide receiver who was like, can't remember the story. It was like he was decently recruited or he had a big year and he had like a bad injury and then came back 
and got injured again late enough in the season when he couldn't get redshirted or something, you know, and like it was just the worst situation for him. But he ran a four three something, like a four three four, four three seven. And it was so, so it was like the guys that were running four fives were only at the 20 yard line when he finished, you know. It was like, you know, it's like NASCAR, like the when a car wins by like like 10 car lengths and it's two hundredths of a second difference, you know. It, it like he was it was just just not even the same sport. It was unbelievable how much faster he was than guys who were very, very fast. Well, I remember, I remember this dude, like I, I, de- I played defense. I, I was like re- def- I took pride in playing defense. Like I, I felt like I could check anybody. And, and I remember, I remember I just could not guard this guy. He was so fucking fast. I could not guard. He would just get around me every, every time. So quick. Yeah. That first so, step. Yeah. It's, and it's like a helpless feeling. It's like there's nothing I can do to stop this guy. Yeah, that's what it was. We all just watched this, like just mesmerized. And so no, no one could guard him. Like it was, you know, like it was a waste for everyone else who was at this combine because as soon as it ended, every scout just went over to talk to this guy because it was, it looked like he was playing against like children who were also playing in sand. I mean, the bodybuilding equivalent of it would be like a Phil Heath or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, everyone knows his story. You know, like he came out of nowhere. He did junior nationals and he walks into junior nationals, doesn't know anything about the sport, about PED use, doesn't know how to diet. And he, he's already clearly could win a pro show. <laughs> you know, I mean, and how do you compete with that guy? You, you, you don't. You just watch and, be, and tell people you competed against them. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, this is one. This is one I get a lot of times. Like, uh, I, I, th- I think Paul said he likes to get at least one meal in before training. Um, uh, I don't know why people think that fasted training is a good idea. I just. <laughs> it's probably not. I mean, I, I don't think it's like the worst thing in the world. There's because. Uh, and I'll explain why I don't think it's good at all. Definitely not. But like you could make an argument that fasted training where then you get the entire day to eat after the workout to recover is, is arguably better than training late at night and only getting one meal after workout. I don't know that I even agree with that, but I think it's something you could have a discussion about, but no, I think the, for me, the all time best way, like if you're a pro bodybuilder, you have nothing else to do, wake up when you're wake up, you know, not to an alarm when you're rested, eat a meal and then go work out, you know, however long after that meal you like to work out. And then you get a meal before your training, your blood sugar stabilize, you have nutrients flowing through your system. You have a blood amino acid levels in your system. Uh, preferably I would prefer you have an intra-workout also, and then you get the whole day to eat the rest of the meals. I, I just don't see it being optimal for building muscle. Oh, no, 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 no. No, well, I'm, yeah, well, I made a poor, poor use of that. It's definitely not optimal. I was just saying there's other things that aren't optimal that people do too. That, but what's most optimal, I think, is eat, train, and then just do the rest of your day. Do you lift in the? You lift in the morning, right? Yeah, I, that's what I do. I wake up, eat, and go train. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a nighttime lifter. I, I lift late. It's the only time I can seem to fit it in with my kids. Well, uh, that's why I for years I tried it's just gotten to where the reason now is because I'm so business focused it's there's never a shutoff time so there's like there's a time I plan to work out which what then ends up happening is me just oh crap it's that time and I run downstairs in my work clothes get a crappy workout the kids are you know in there the dogs are in there the and then now with sports kids sports it's so hard that so they're at school when I train that's like that's why I do it now I can't remember where I saw it. I think it was Dr. Todd that had this stuff, but there was a study showing uh, higher rates of muscle tears and injuries and in, with fasted workouts too. It, it, has, it has to do, I, I would imagine it has to do with hydration. Yeah. I, that and flexibility. I mean, think how unflexible you are in the morning, you know, yeah. like try, t- stretch at 6 a.m. and then stretch again at 6 p.m. and see how, like, I can't even... I, I, you know, I, like if I worked out after work, I could drop right into a squat, put a bar on my back and start squatting. There's no way I'm walking down at, at 5 a.m. just walking over to the squat bar and squatting with any kind of squat form. Everything's too stiff and tight. Yeah, I mean, there's no way I could do it. All right. Uh, this is a good one for you. This fits in with the suppressor product that you guys sell. But uh, the best way to utilize berberine around carb meals to help stay lean and drop some fat. The best way is to use it every day. Uh, it, it's not just like it's not like a 
people think it like blocks the carbs or something like that. It, it doesn't. Berberine works uh, generally through a cascade reaction with IGF-1 to increase the, the, the pancreas's ability to produce insulin and, and maintain stable blood sugar levels. And so, and it's got a short uh, half-life. So really what you want to do is at least three times a day uh, and you want 1500 milligrams of berberine per day. And ideally, and the reason we created it this way is I think the all time best product is our product suppressor at first attachment 1D, uh, where if you take just one capsule with every meal, every meal of the week, we our serving is five meals per day, just because the way it worked out to get 1500 milligrams of berberine with our other products worked out to five capsules, you know, but if you eat six meals a day, then you just get, you know, 1700 milligrams of berberine or whatever. But one, one meal of Per, one capsule per meal, every meal of your life, basically. The problem is, is you, it's hard to get people that. Uh, and then, and be, that's that's the way I do it. I do one one at each meal. Yeah, but you got to be pretty it, you, uh, obsessed with the sport, you know. So if you can't do that, if you can at least do, you know, five hundred milligrams worth of berberine, or like if you do two suppressor with uh, bre at breakfast, two suppressor with lunch, two suppressor with your post workout meal, something like that. I think berberine has a half life of about five hours, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Um, and so you, uh, the other stuff that you have in here, the fenugreek, um, it, it, doesn't that help I, I, bur with the uptake of berberine, right? Yeah, well, fenugreek also increases insulin uh, secretion the uh, same way, and uh, it's actually good for breast. It, it, <laughs> through that through that pathway, it helps increase the rate of breast milk production. Uh, and then the the piperine increases the bioavailability, and the cinnamon increases the bioavailability oh, so a little bit also. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and then the R A L R alpha lipoic acid is just a good product. We are actually working on, and we're sourcing all the materials currently for what's going to be suppressor max. And I don't want to say too much, and I always almost do, but everyone's looking at dihydroberberine, and that might be one of the next questions. Why don't you use dihydroberberine? And dihydroberberine is more bioavailable. Uh, but I, I always I always joke that no one reads the studies because if if you read the abstract, it'll say you know dihydroberberine is a is higher bioavailability than berberine. But if you read the study, which no one does, you'll see that it doesn't seem to improve blood glucose levels over berberine alone. So everyone's kind of I think all the supplement companies are making this push towards dihydroberberine, and all they're doing is going to be making a more expensive product that uh, that doesn't seem to improve blood glucose over berberine. Whatever it does, how you know it's more bioavailable. It gets in the blood apparently better somehow to some small extent, but not enough to increase uh, the improved blood glucose levels. There is something else you can do to berberine, and I don't want to say what it is, and I don't even want to like hint too much because uh, I don't want anyone to guess it. But it's got research studies on it, uh, and and in the the several main ones, it imp it actually does improve blood glucose over berberine, berberine alone somewhere around 20 percent the lowest study i've seen was 20 percent the highest was 22.5 percent and so at that point uh because 1500 milligrams of berberine in a day in my experience improves a1c over time roughly equivalent to about a thousand milligrams of metformin where you now like and i know you like metformin and you and if you have high a1c and elevated blood sugar you need to get it down you're not going to grow optimally it, it, but if you don't, the reason I don't like metformin is metformin works through cyclic AMP, which is like an anti-hypertrophy pathway. It actually fights against muscle growth. Now, if you're on PEDs, it's probably not making a big impact. You know, it's like it's like throwing a deck chair off the Titanic and saying, hey, we're not going to sink now. You know, it's like it's a small difference. But if you can, uh, I think the suppressor max will actually be better than a thousand milligrams of metformin per day at improving blood glucose levels. If the studies, I mean, if if the real world data holds up like the studies show, I, I've been having a battle with uh, metformin lately. It just absolutely fucking nukes my appetite. Yeah, that's another reason I don't like it. Yeah, because the big because the, most of the people who, who would actually need it, like the young guys that are, you know, like it's great for longevity and health, but the young guys probably don't have A one C issues. The guys that are going to have issues with A one C are the guys that are carrying a ton of body mass, and I've been doing this a long time. You know, and so in cases, they're the ones who are probably going to need it. And then that's the problem is that I'm one of those people. Appetite. Yeah. And it just it kills appetite where berberine doesn't do that. Berberine kind of indifferent. If anything, it might stimulate appetite because, you know, IGF-1 is, is, is in general an appetite stimulant. I mean, it stimulates appetite by lowering our blood sugar, but it either way. 
This is a good one for you. Uh, we'll we'll wrap up soon. But uh, how long does it take to build up your metabolism to handle like four thousand calories uh, without getting fat? I, I you know I, I think the context is here is uh, you, you I know with you you have a process of slowly ratcheting up food and, mm -hmm. and building yourself into a food processing machine. So what does that look like? I mean, like how long is, is impossible to say because it's different for everyone. We have a case study up at, again, at teamtroponin.com. And I hate to just push my stuff, but it's a subscription website and it is a good site. But we have a full case study that shows where I followed a natural guy, athlete. And this was years ago. His name was Adam. Really cool client. I remember who, reading that. Yeah, who struggled. He could, you know, he was, he, he got himself into what a lot of guys do where they're basically starving themselves and still chubby, you know, and nowhere to go from it. And we skinny got him, fat. Yep, skinny <laughs> fat. We got him from an average of about eighteen or nineteen hundred calories a day to I think at his peak over forty five hundred calories a day total. But for him, it took eighteen months. And for and for him, it was that was the only goal. He was just sick of not being able to eat without getting fat. And so, the, like hypertrophy wasn't the goal. I mean, that stuff could happen, you know, obviously. But like the way we did cardio and the way we did things was was all focused on increasing his metabolism but for that so basically a similar case starting at 2k to a little over 4k that was 18 months so i'm going to say you know like if you're still if your goal is still hypertrophy and you know doing this while building muscle you're probably looking at two years at least you have, uh, time for, you have time for a couple more Justin? absolutely yeah i mean yeah yeah all right um so this is one for you uh is adding uh this this is a good one is adding a tab of bronchade max and some additional johan body cl to one go pill twice a day the best way to utilize yeah yeah and the anyone who looks at go pills though go pills work they're great they're great fat butter they don't have any they don't have any of the crap that doesn't work like gogglesterones or anything like that it's only got the stuff that actually works but the actuality of it is as a bodybuilder and someone who coaches bodybuilders it was designed to work with like one-to-one -one with bronchade where basically one capsule of go pill combined with one bronchade max is kind of the ideal fat burner the only thing different is I, with go pills we lower the yohim mind to 2.5 milligrams because a lot of people don't about 30 percent of people don't tolerate yohim mind very well at about at five milligrams anyways and then that allowed us to, if you notice, like our teacrine and caffeine, and teacrine is kind of high, but caffeine is only 150. So that actually allows people who tolerate Yohim, Yohim mine well to do two servings of Go Pills with the Bronchade Max. And if you look, each we load the bottle up. We have 120 capsules. So we're not like a 30 capsule bottle. So even at two capsules twice a day, you're still like a month supply of, of, of that. But that was, yeah, that Go pills was designed to work with bronchitis, basically the optimal fat fat burner. So if uh, if you're going to compete in a bodybuilding show and you want basically what like me as a coach thought or thinks was the optimal way to introduce fat burners, it would be one to two servings of go pill per day or one to two servings twice a day of go pills combined with bronchitis max at, starting at about 12 weeks out. And then some, a... somewhere later in prep, we'd add clen, but. Uh, and say it's it's the cy of the ecy stack yeah 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 but yeah yeah with uh, but with other things i mean we have e egcg from green tea which uh, is there for a reason we have teacrine uh which is because the way caffeine works is caffeine uh, blocks adenosine receptors and adenosine is like kind of like the uh the sleepy receptor of the body so caffeine is less a stimulant it's not really a stimulant it's more of a it blocks the the things that make you sleepy and on one, one of these, on a YouTube video, someone commented that that's not technically true. And it isn't technically true. There is some beta agonism with caffeine, but it's, it's hard to know. And in mice, it appears to be primarily beta-1 uh, uh, agonistic or whatever. Discount code. Trope 10 you can use. Go ahead and use my discount code. Or you can use Paul's. Paul gets money if you use his Paul. Give him the code, Paul. <laughs> AB10. Yeah, use AB10 so Paul gets paid. Uh, and then uh, 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 I forgot where I was. Oh, but but the problem is then with caffeine is it blocks adenosine receptors, and it, you can if you take too much, you kind of feel like jittery and kind of crappy. Well, teacrine works differently. Teacrine works on adenosine also, but it works by lowering the levels of adenosine in your body, not just by blocking the receptors. 
So you can actually get more stimulant without feeling that jitteriness and you can get more of the fat oxidation, more of the energy and the benefits from caffeine and adenosine antagonists without, without the, uh, the jitteriness and agitation you get from just the caffeine. So, I mean, a real, like, you know, obviously I won't, I've been doing this a long time. If I put a product together, it was for a reason, but uh, yeah, I think yeah, that combined with, with bronchite is, it, it was meant, it was meant to it, it designed that way for a reason. All right. I'm going to get uh, one last one in here and then I, I know you got a day in front of you. So do I, uh, okay. Uh, what is the most low days Justin has done in a contest diet before a high day? In a week <laughs> or <laughs> six. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Typically, in general, my low days are only days you don't train. And then I have medium days on days you train. But what happens in a contest prep is carbs and calories get low. And then pretty soon, even your medium days are pretty low calorie. They might not be as low as the low. But there have been lots of times where I've had to take people. I mean, some people just can't, aren't, don't get in shape. And you got to, I mean, it doesn't matter how hard you work. It only matters what you look like on stage, you know. And so if you want to win on stage, you have to do what it takes to win. And so there's been lots of times where I've had to do people with six low days, even six zero carb days or vegetable only days and one high day. Man, I, I, I have some people that just, it's like it's it's frustrating you just can't get the fat off of them and then there's other guys there's other guys like i'm feeding hundreds of grams of carbs yeah. and they're just dropping weight too fast yeah it, it feels so terrible for the guys who want it so bad and i was a lower metabolism guy so i can feel for them but the guys that want it so bad and just don't have the metabolism i, I tend to be the opposite it's like my metabolism just starts yeah, spinning is, faster and faster, well, that's what, and faster yeah like yours is good but then you got to pay real close attention because it's like it'll get a rocket lit underneath it. And uh, that, that Chris Cashman was the same way. He was his just took off on us too. And it's a weird phenomenon when that happens. Why do you think that is with some people? I mean, I it have seems no to idea, be the exception, it not the make, rule. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, like if you go first principles and say well, evolutionarily, that's terrible. That means in times of famine, <laughs> they're the first to die. I guess maybe that's good. It's like, well, there's no more woolly mammoths to woolly mammoths to kill. At least I don't have to live a long time. I'll just starve to death real quickly. You know, I don't. You know, I don't know. Some people just like from from the cardio and and just it's like a cascade of everything. And they they just the things just rev up. They're hot all the time. It's, yeah, uh, that's you know. what happens to me, man. I hear guys talking about getting tired and stuff at the end of the contest prep. I'm like, I'm the exact opposite, man. I am wired up. I mean, I, I, I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I was high. I was a tired guy. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to see how differently people respond to things. But yeah, the I don't have a reason because most things make evolutionary sense. You know, like being tired makes sense because how do you survive a famine? If how do you, if there's no food, what's the easiest way to survive? Don't move. So you can imagine your body. The people who survive famines would be the people who. Well, for whatever reason, their body sent really painful signals that they were too tired to do much activity until food came around. And then hey, there's food. Now let me go kill it. And now I'll be fine. So that that makes sense. The people whose metabolism like rev up don't it doesn't make sense to me, but it happens. Uh, all right. I got one more. This is actually a good one. I, I'm going to squeeze this one. Uh, do, uh, do you tend to go uh, lower cardio or food first? Or do more cardio or do food? Lower food, probably. But they're pretty in, in sync. I don't really do much with cardio. I usually have people start at prep about 16 weeks out. Almost everyone, because it's, it's just really hard to get in shape. I'm not one of those 20-week prep guys. Like, I know Matt Porter was, like, sometimes, like, a 24-week guy. I think past about 16 weeks, people really start struggling mentally. Uh, it used to always be 12 through the 90s and up until the mid 2000s. It was everyone did 12 week preps. But then the problem with that is if you get sick or if you know, if anything happens, you're screwed. You got no leeway. So I like to do 16 weeks. I don't really increase cardio at all until 12 weeks. It's all diet changes until 12 weeks. And then basically from 12 to about six weeks, left, the diet and cardio both ramp up really quickly because I like to pretty much have things maxed out about six weeks out where I call that hell week usually. And then basically from six weeks out until you're stage ready, we just push you and push you and push you and you have to be flat and you get flat and you get small and you look like shit. But if you get ready in time, then we can start bringing food back in 
which we were able to do the last prep with you. The first prep, I don't think we did it well enough, but I mean, I know we didn't do it well enough the first prep, but if we did it at all, but. Well, I mean, I had no idea my metabolism was going to do that. I don't think you did either. No, it was wild. Yeah. All right, man. I think that's all I got. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of others we didn't get to. I mean, I had a lot of, I was very, very surprised at how many people participated on a Sunday. I guess people oh, have nothing awesome. better to do, yeah. but hang out with us. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause I was worried. You never know. Like I'm an old fat guy is not very attractive. It's like you know, <laughs> <laughs> my, my family doesn't want to hang out with me on a Sunday. So. Well, folks, if you want to support Justin, uh, head over to First Attachment, pick up uh, his supplements there. Discount code is AB10. Also, Team Troponin, um, Justin's um, uh, membership site where you uh, information on training, PEDs, nutrition. If you want to get the inside information on how everything's done, head over there and sign up for a membership. It's 20 bucks a month, right, Justin? Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Which is a good deal you should be charging more <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff yeah paul's going to be adding some content there too so yeah i'm going to be adding some stuff here soon so yeah. look be on the lookout for that but well, i appreciate you also, coming on i want to just just say and then okay. my, my, my my main site because i actually do have a couple openings which is rare uh troponin nutrition.com uh if you if you're looking for a coach uh it because contest seasons this is kind of the time of the year where from from april to late june is madness because it's all the state shows and so but then those guys start falling off and you start getting openings uh and then you know and then you got the the, the summer is all the, the pro qualifiers and then the the fall is again the the nat, the state shows qualifying for the nationals and stuff but uh so i have some openings so but but don't if you if you're interested in work with me troponinnutrition.com send uh contact us or whatever and, and then you will see if you know if i have a spot well, I can tell you, if you want to catch a good rebound after your show, That's don't miss favorite. out on that, guys. Hit, hit, hit Justin off for that. I'm, I, I can't tell you how many people miss out on that rebound. Oh it my just God. blows my mind. Yeah. It's like you could see it like the, you could see the progress you've made. You can see what like David Lamartina made. You could see what uh, 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 Dominic Trevlini made, what Ben uh, Pollock made. What, I mean, over and over and over again, it's like it just blows my mind that people don't do it. And you don't have to do much. It takes, you know, just for one more month, you have to be, you don't have to even use a lot of PEDs just for one more month. You just have to be pretty diligent with your food and boom, you'll be bigger than you've ever been. It just blows me away. Like like most coaches will pull guys off of everything and then do this yeah. stupid reverse diet out of, of, of yeah. shows, which is why and I, you could see, I mean, like we want a case study. How many, how many guys compete eight years in a row trying to win heavyweights at nationals? you know, all of them a lot. I've never had a guy stay in the same weight class more than two years in a row because of the rebound. They're, they're a middleweight, then they're the light heavyweight, then they're heavyweight, then they're super heavyweight, unless they turn pro along the way. But it's every year we're adding, I mean, like, yeah, like guys be a heavyweight eight years in a row. What, you know, like you put all the, all that work to weigh the exact same as you did, you know, in 2016, 15, that's another rant I can get on, man, that I don't understand with people is why they want to stay in the weight class. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to go up to the super heavy. I'm like, why? Yeah. But, I mean, I understand like, cause it, like the first time it's scary because if you do move up a weight class and you're not the most shredded, all, the judges are going to say like, well, you should have just stayed in the weight class, you know? But if you, if, if you're like 222 and then the next year you can be 246 in shape. Why lose muscle to come back to 222 when 222 didn't win you a pro card the year before? I will say this. I have seen a lot of fat, super heavies at the yeah, national yeah. level. At the net, Yeah, yeah. At all levels, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Justin, I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you. For, thank um, you. And guys, thank you for your support. Take care.